system. All right, well, we're, we've gone live, and hopefully some people will be jumping on here really quick. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of changes that are taking place. And um, as a pastor, one of the things that really has always got a hold of my heart is when I'm with family members, and one of the family members is, you know, about to die, or, or maybe they just died, and, and, uh, and their conscience begins to eat at them. So I thought tonight I'd be talking about, uh, you know, uh, leaving with a clear conscience. And so uh, we're going to start out in Matthew chapter 6, verse 22 and 23. And uh, so, uh, well, hi, Tigger, so good to see you. And, uh, and uh, we, we're praying for all of y'all right now. We just had a big prayer for y'all. All right. So t tonight I want to do consider the topic concerning our conscience. And so when people... Um, they've gone through life and they're getting to the end of their life and uh, a lot of times they just want to you know leave with a clear conscience and so same way there's a lot of people that are uh, we're one of those that's moving and uh, God is blessing us we're moving our ministry uh, down to the Tyler area and uh, and you kind of go back and you reflect and you think about all the people and the people that's active in your life now especially and those that have decided no, to no longer be active in your life. But the one thing that I want to clarify is everybody here has some form of a conscience. So let's, let's consider uh, how that, that word conscience, Lady Karen, is pictured in the Word of God. Turn to Matthew chapter 6, verse 22 through 23. Now, I want to show you some things here. Now, I've, I've always preached on this. In fact, it wasn't too long ago that we, we dealt with, uh, you know, the subject of what about a conscience. So, but I'm talking about leaving. Uh, there, there's a lot of people that maybe someone is in your life, and, and um, we've had people as a pastor, I know that they realize that somebody's fixing to pass on, maybe a friend or a relative, and, and the one thing that they're prompted to do, the Holy Spirit prompts them to make a phone call, and try to make a visit and try to get some things cleared up and cleaned up, you know, even if it's just saying I'm sorry, uh, you know, or to let somebody know how much they really do mean to you. And so let's start with Matthew chapter 6, verse 22 through 23. Now notice this. He says, the light of the body is the eye. If therefore thy eye be single, okay, now the opposite single, I want you to write the word healthy, all right? So if thy eye be healthy or single, thy whole body shall be full of light. And one of the things is, is today I see so many people still living in the past, living in that darkness, you know, and uh, you have to let go of that. And I, as a counselor, as a pastoral counselor, I've had people that have went through maybe some form of a sexual trauma, even as a child. And I just, I try to help them to understand that you, I'm sorry that people go through that stuff, but here's the deal. They're not going through it now. And the only reason why they're even thinking about it is they're placing, they're, they're, they're not refusing and everything to let that go. And it just seems to dominate their life. But I teach this and I want to share it with you. And uh, Tigger, it's, uh, you know what, you've heard it so many times, you know, uh, what it was is what it was. And then you pause and think about whatever the issues was, that you, and your conscience begins to bring those things up to the surface. And just think about it. You can't change it. You can't alter it. You can't erase it. But here's the deal. You don't have to dwell on it. Do you get that? You don't have to dwell on it. And so when those memories come to you, you just rebuke them right then and there and, and, and force your thoughts onto something else. But what it was, it's what it was. And then after you've thought about it, I want you to say it out loud. Hi, Victoria. We're praying for you and your family. Uh, so what it was is what it was. And, and then think about it and then say it out loud, it's okay. So in other words, you thought about it, you uh, rationalized it, but you, you have to just say, well, it, it may not be okay with maybe what you went through, but you've got to be okay that's part of your past. Does that make sense? You know, Paul said, you know, forgetting uh, those things, forgetting the past. 
And so if we're going to have a clear conscience, uh, you, you need to write this power phrase down. What it was is what it was and think about it and say, I'm okay with it. You know, you, you can't just, by that you're saying, I'm not going to let that dominate my life. I'm not going to let it take away my happiness. So what it was is what it was. Then power phrase number two, and you've heard, I know Victoria, you've heard me preach on this right here, is what it is, is what it is. Whatever your situation is right now, whatever you're going through, maybe you're going through a breakup or a divorce, maybe you've lost your job, maybe some of your friends no, lo no longer call you, and, and maybe you're going through an illness, and uh, uh, Victoria, we're praying uh, for your back, and uh, uh, but maybe you're going through that, and people will actually go through a depression, and their anxiety takes over. Why? Because they're just looking at what it is and running that through their mind with, well, what could it be? What's going to happen? So in that power phrase, what it was is what it was, they say, that's okay. And then what it is is what it is. This is your present life right now. And just say, that's okay. Now, it may not be uh, what you want, but you have, you're in a position uh, to, to paint a new picture. I always like to take a, a lady care, I'll take a book when I'm doing Christian counseling. And I'll hand them that book. And I'll say, now go to chapter one. And they do. And then after we talked about chapter one a little bit, of whatever it might be in their life, now I ask them to go to chapter number two. And I said, now we've already dealt with chapter one. Why would we go back and reread that? Doesn't make sense, does it? So when you're reading a book, you go chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, and so on, until you get to the end. Well, that illustration is our life. Uh, chapter one could be in the time that you were born. Chapter two might be in your really early childhood. Chapter three was your wild teenage years, right? And then number four, uh, chapter four might be you entered into a big old relationship. And Nancy's good to see you. Be sure and text me your s cell number because we tried calling. Lady Karen and I tried to call it to get a hold of you, and it wouldn't let us call you. All right. So once again, leaving with a clear conscience. So here it is. Here's the power phrase. What it is is, I mean, what it was is what it was. And what are you supposed to say? And that's okay. You've got to be okay with that. Okay? And that means you're going to let it go. What it is, is what it is. And then, that's okay. And then, the next one, number three. What it's going to be, is what, Lady Karen? It's going to be. What it's going to be. I don't know what tomorrow's going to hold. I know that God's got whatever it is planned out. He's ordering our footsteps. But, uh, but I'm not going to sit there and freak out and worry about it. Uh, some people, that's if they're in a bind and everything, that's all they think about. They, they can't go to bed. They can't sleep. They can't rest because they're thinking about all these different scenarios. And there's nothing wrong in rationalizing, saying, well, if this happens to me tomorrow, then this will be my ABC. This is what I'm going to do about that situation. And so uh, there's nothing wrong with that. But when it's time to go to bed, folks, listen, go to bed and shut off the TV Get off the phone and prepare yourself for that t moment. So what it's going to be, just think about this. You're not in control of a lot of that stuff. So why are you letting it control you? So what it's going to be is what it's going to be, and that's okay. So here's the paraphrase. We'll repeat it again. Uh, Lady Karen, you ready? What it was is what it was. That's okay. Number two, what it is is what it is, and that's okay. Catherine James, good to see you. And then number three, what it's going to be, is what it's going to be. If it rains tomorrow, I have no control over that, you know. But I've got to be prepared for whatever comes my way. But I'm just going to go ahead and put my trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and just trust Him not only for my getting rid of, help me to overcome my past, but to trust Him to what? For my present and to trust Him for my tomorrow. And then you've got to say, that's okay, all right? And then here's the most important, the fourth and final part in everything. And all that matters is my attitude and my actions, and those are up to me. Did you get that? It's my attitude and my actions, and those are up to me. That means you're really in control. Uh, you don't have to let other people. I see everybody, uh, 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 Catherine and James, I see them allowing the drama of other people to infect them. 
And uh, Nancy, I'm sure you've seen that. You probably experienced that. Tigger, I know that you have. Lady Karen, you and I both have. But we have to let that stuff go. Whatever was in the past, put it in the past and let it go. Whatever is happening today, you know, you're going to deal with it in a positive way, hopefully in a spiritual response. But today is going to be over. And tomorrow is going to be whatever it's going to be. But my attitude and my actions, those are up to me. Now, what does it have to do with a clear conscience? Well, 1 John 1, 9 talks about that, doesn't it? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of all our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Brother Brent, good to see you, brother. We're talking about leaving with a clear conscience. And we start out in Matthew chapter 6, verse 22 through 23. Let's go back and repeat this. The light of the body. So in other words, don't live in darkness. The light of the body is the eye. It's what you choose to see. All right? If therefore thy eye be single, and what do we say the word single means? Healthy. If thy eye be healthy, thy whole body shall be full of light. Verse 23, but if thy eye be evil, if all you see is the negative, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. And if therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness. So something within the heart of every person, everything, uh, they, they have this understanding of what might be right and what might be wrong. And the problem with our conscience is, is we can, we can uh, uh, you know, scar that conscience. For example, there are people that have gotten into sin and they no longer confess it as sin. They just live in that sin and, and it's always a dead end road for them. And so, Nancy, I, I agree. Uh, drama, 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 drama. You're exactly right. Uh, you, you, if, if people are going to be around you and they, all they're going to do is talk about their drama, then here's what you might say to them. Say, I love you, I care about you, and I'll pray with you. And if you need to talk, we'll schedule the time. And you, you've got to put down a time. Otherwise, you can spend hours upon hours upon hours while people vent. Does that make sense? Even I, when I do Christian counseling, I schedule the time. Uh, it's normally a, a one to two hour session, and then we're done. All right? Because after that, it's just rehearsal. It's almost like being around, and I don't mean to make anybody mad, it's like being around someone who's highly intoxicated. All they do is talk about their problems. All they do is blame everybody about it. And then they take another drink, another drink, another drink, another drink, you know, trying to numb it. But here's the deal. Uh, you, you don't have to live in the past. And even though today might not have been a good day, tomorrow is a promise. All right? So uh, please understand this. One of the things that you're going to need to do, if, if you're uh, like us, we're we're fixing to move out of town, and we try to contact all of our friends that have, want to interact with us. And Lady Karen had a birthday party, and we had so much fun, and all of our friends showed up. But you know what? What if there was a friend that wasn't able to make it for whatever reason? Maybe they were still, maybe they were angry. Well, the Bible teaches us that if there's a problem, you're to go to that person. Now, you may not be able to travel to them, but you can call them on the phone. Does that make sense? Uh, you can send them a text saying, hey, can we talk? But the Bible says, if you bring a gift and lay it on the altar for God, God says, no, I'm not going to receive it till you make it right with that person. And, and you, it might be a card in the mail that you send to them saying, hey, you know, you, you're more important to me than the problem that was created. So I'm sorry, will you forgive me? And, and, uh, and let's just reconnect. So the Bible is very clear that once you've gone to that friend and, they, and you've tried to restore it, then you can place your offering to God on the altar. Now that's important, why? Because God wants you to be, your body to be full of light. Did you get that? To where everything is clear. Uh, my wife, we always tease her and everything. She lives in, in a butterfly bubble world, and that's all she wants, right? She, she, and I love that uh, because uh, we, we don't want the negative because I don't want it to take away from the, what God had for me today. I don't want to take away what God had for me today. And so, once again, clear your conscience 
uh, forgive others, and, and just do it instantly with no recall of the wrong. Now, that's hard for some people, all right? Why? Because, you know, uh, uh, if you don't forgive them, the book of Matthew says that we're to forgive those who trespass against us. Did you get that? It's so important to let go of that because that's going to pull you down, keep you from moving forward and enjoying the present that you had today. And so uh, you got to forgive others. And some people say, I have, uh, one lady told me, she said uh, on Facebook, she says, I'll forgive, but I'll never forget. Well, of course, you know, you, you've got to quit rehearsing that through your mind. And so uh, we talk about this and God talks about it. So let, let's leave with a clear conscience. Let's leave. Uh, we're leaving Lubbock and moving to the Tyler area. To uh, Our home office is going to be there now, and, and we're going to be running a couple of ministries there, and, and we're excited about that. But we, if, if we ran across somebody that was still mad at us and everything, I wouldn't have a problem saying, hey, I just want you to know that we love you in the Lord. Now, let me say something here. Sometimes the only way to love somebody is in the Lord. Right? I mean, they just rub you the wrong way. But, uh, but you got to let that go. So forgive others instantly and don't spend your time thinking about the wrongs that they've done when you see them. So forgive them instantly with no recall of any wrongs, and that's going to make you feel better. Number two, love a person uh, with real love as often as you can. And, uh, one person said this, they said, never not take the last phone call. Think about that. Oh, that's, that's my mom, I'll just call her back later. Oh, that's my friend, I'll just call her back later. Or that's my husband or my wife. But never take, but never not take the last phone call. Another one was said this, never let anything get in the way of experiencing that someone in your life. You know, the Bible is very clear that we're not to let the sun go down on our wrath. Did you know that? The Bible is very clear. In other words, uh, don't, don't go to bed and because all you're going to do is dream about it and be angry. You were angry that night. You're going to be angry the next morning, bitter that night, bitter the next morning. So find a way to let the Holy Spirit of God and the presence of God uh, help you to understand that you never, ever, ever let anything Get in the way of experiencing that someone in your life, whether it be a friend, whether it be a mate, whatever it might be. And then uh, <clears throat> number three, do all that you can. Now listen carefully. To never damage another person in any way on purpose. Let me say it again. Do all that you can to never damage another person in any way on purpose and then be determined to not just uh, do good today but to do your very best every day around anyone that walks in front of you in your life okay so I tell people don't let if somebody robs your joy last month don't let them rob your joy this month in fact the Bible even says to come out from among them and be you what separate saith who the Lord you know, in Abraham and Lot, they, they got to where all the herdsmen were fighting and arguing over the land. And, and Abraham said, well, you can either choose you know, the, the lower part like Sodom and Gomorrah, or you can stay in the mountain. But whichever one you choose, I'll take the other. And, of course, Lot said, uh, Lady Karen, I'm going to take all, all my men and all of my uh, belongings, and I'm going to just leave you. And he went down to Sodom and Gomorrah which had a horrible influence on him and his daughters he, and even his wife. Uh, in fact, if you know the story, uh, God even sent angels to get him out. And did you know that Abraham actually went down there to try to get Lot out? Even though, so in other words, he didn't remember the damage or the hurts or the words that were said. And so because all the herdsmen between Abraham and Lot were fighting, there had to come a time where you come out from among them and be you what? Separate. That means you still love them. You still pray for them. But you're not going to hang around them. All right? And so the four, uh, uh, first was forgive instantly. Number two was to love a person as deeply as you can. And to uh, never take a single moment in life for granted. 
That person may not be here tomorrow. You may not be here tomorrow. And you don't want to take and leave this life or leave like us. We're leaving Lubbock. And, and, and we want to make things right. If anybody, I tell people, if, you, if I've offended you in any way, I'm sorry. And I, and I mean it. I feel that. I'm sorry. Okay? Because I, I want to still connect with that person if it be possible. But sometimes the only way to love someone is what? In the Lord. That's what you pray for them. Okay? And so uh, uh, never let anything get in the way of experiencing that someone in your life. The next one is do all you can, remember, to never damage any person on purpose. And then the next one. Are you ready? People will come and go in this thing called life. Some people are like the leaf on a tree. They're here today and they fall off and the wind blows them away. Then some are like the stems that hang around for a little while but die out pretty soon. But then there are those that are like the base of the tree, strong, and, 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 and yet they've been with you forever and they, they support everything, right? But the key person is the root. That's where they love you deeply. And they don't remember the sins or the words that you said that might have damaged or hurt them. Why? That's the people you want to keep around. That's the ones that, that will answer your phone calls. That's the one that will call and check on you and care about you. That's the one that will send you a funny picture uh, on, on your texting. It's the one that will call you up or maybe sit down and, and have dinner with you on a regular basis. You know, it's they don't forget you. And so... Uh, but people will come and go in this thing called life. And yet, but here's the problem with that. I want you to write this phrase down. People will come and go in this thing called life. That's part one. Here's part two. But regrets, guilt, and lost opportunities will last you a lifetime. Oh, I wish, I always hear people find out that someone maybe is, a schoolmate or like that, where they, they thought, well, I'll give them a call, and all of a sudden they find out they died. Oh, the regret and the guilt and the lost opportunities will last you a lifetime. So uh, it's important to sow the good seeds in every relationship that we experience starting right now, today. Be determined in your own heart and, and confess it. If it was If there was sin involved, Say in 1 John 1, 9, Lord, I'm confessing that sin. Now, we talked about why there's a 1 John 1, 9 not too long ago. Do you all remember why there's a 1 John 1, 9? It's because now Christ died for all of my sins, past, present, and future. But if I don't confess it to God, then that's that, that, that guilt and that regret and, and that lost opportunity are going to eat away to me. To where I've seen people get bitter and angry, frustrated. But what do you do? First John 1 John 1.9 says you need to confess your sins. Just need to come forward and say, God, I'm, I've been angry. I've been hurt. And Lord, I, what happened to me, I know it was wrong. But Lord, I keep it running it through my mind. So would you forgive me for my sin? And then he says what? And that God will do what? Cleanse you. Of all unrighteous. He's going to put, let the light inside of you. The Holy Spirit just blossom in your life. And you're going to be so glad that you did that. Now you don't have to go tell the whole world. Don't pass it on Facebook. Oh, I, I committed this. <laughs> That's it. Don't do that. Build a good, strong relationship. But go to God and confess it. Remember I gave you an illustration when you cared not too long ago. That we gave to the pastor up there in Tyler. That we visited his church. And... Uh, we talked about people writing all their sins down on a piece of paper. Remember that? And then they went forward and we had a shredder. And they were they had to put their name at the top. But they, but they told God, God, what I'm holding in my hand, these are my sins. And I'm asking for forgiveness. And then they shred it. Now then, when they walked back from that altar, they, they, had, they had to make a decision. I'm not going to drag my suitcase of sins with me. It's amazing how people ask God to forgive them for the same sin over and over and over. And they're not even committing now. Listen, either God forgave you or he didn't. Either your slate is clean. Either God has cleansed you or he hasn't. But the Bible says in 1 John chapter 2 that we have an intercessor named Jesus Christ, a mediator, a go-between. 
that's always always standing up for us before God. All right, and Jesus says, you know, Father, I that sin that old uh, Doctor H committed, he confessed. Did you know I died for that sin too? I want you to forgive him, restore him. You know what David did? That's why he wrote uh, Psalms fifty-seven. Uh, and 51, why? Because he, he just had to confess it so that God could give him back the joy of his salvation. All right? So we know that our conscience is an internal, rational capacity that bears witness to a value system. And uh, so you have to understand that uh, I, I remember uh, there was a, a, a young man, he was a comedian, and Back then, he would start to use some foul language, and, and normally that wasn't accepted when I was a child. And, and uh, but all of a sudden, he'd say his name was Flip Wilson, and he said, "Oh, the devil made me do it. The devil made me do it." Well, the devil doesn't make you do anything. He might put something in front of you, but then you chose. You made that choice, right? The problem with our conscience is we, we if we're raised in a way that is wrong, and, and maybe you're considering. I, an act that is wrong. I, I noticed on YouTube that uh, they had a, a video, thought it was funny, uh, of these parents giving their children alcohol and they get a little tipsy and they fall over and they thought it was so funny. See, and if you're raised that way, you don't know the difference of right and wrong in that area. So I'm just using that as an illustration, okay? So what am I saying? If, you, if, you, if your value system as a child was not based on the value systems of God, then all you have is the world and what you've gone through, and there may not be any conviction from your uh, uh, conscience. But if you have, if you know God's word, you know the value of right and the value of wrong, and you commit it. For example, just using us out there, have, maybe you hear people using God's name in vain. And that's, you know, they'd be God, and they give him a last name. Now, I'll just do it this way, like Hoover Dam, okay? And, uh, but as a Christian, does that bother you? Bothers me. Why? Conviction from the Holy Spirit. But then there are times where, you know, we, we, we don't realize it, but uh, we'll, we can bash our thumb with a hammer and go, oh, Jesus. Now, really, you're, you're taking the Lord's name in vain. Do you know that? Because you're not put into reverence. When you hear the name Jesus, the Bible says every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that he's God. So we don't want to make his name lower. We want to keep it high up there. So we need to think about that. So what, now that you know what I just said, you say, well, I say Jesus all the time. Well, then ask God to uh, say, hey, if that's sin, well, then I want you to let the Holy Spirit convict me so that I, I can quit doing that practice. Does that make sense? See, when somebody wants to get saved, a lot of people think they'll get saved whenever they want to, and that's not true. You know, the Father gives them to Jesus, and except the Holy Spirit of God draw them, no man shall be saved. Listen, if, if the Holy Spirit's trying to work on your heart and get you saved, and you keep saying no, it's like somebody going to church. I used to watch this all the time. And there'll be such heavy conviction that a man uh, would grab the back of the pew while they're standing. His knuckles were turning white, but he, he refused, he refused to go down there and make a profession of faith. Came back the next week, listened to my sermon, and the Holy Spirit grabbed his heart. Same thing, we stood up to give an altar call. Man, he, you could see he just almost wanted to put his hands through that, that wooden uh, pew that we had, but he said no. He said he didn't respond to God. And after the third week and the fourth week, same thing happened. But then after a while, he didn't grab that pew anymore. After a while, he didn't try, he didn't have the conviction that he was experiencing two or three weeks ago. And then after a while, his hands were never on the pew. Why? Because he chose to harden his own heart toward God. So when the Holy Spirit, somebody said, what is the unpardonable sin? The unpardonable sin is whenever you take and, and you refuse the calling of the Holy Spirit to bring you to Jesus for salvation. And you kept saying no and no and no. And all of a sudden, now you've hardened your heart. Now it doesn't bother you. 
In fact, you can go to church and enjoy the singing and, and even say some amens that the preacher's preaching on, but the conviction is no longer there. And after a while, you know, because the Holy Spirit is not able to come in, and because and, the Bible said even Pharaoh, remember that? Pharaoh hardened his own heart toward God. Remember that? When he said, let my people go, he kept saying no. When the plagues would come, he would say no. Let my people free, he said no. And after a while, God knew that he had reached a point that because he's chosen to harden his own heart, the Bible says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. He just went in and said, I'm not going to deal with him anymore. And so the sin against the Holy Spirit of God trying to convict you to come and get saved by the blood of Jesus Christ is that's the unpardonable sin. That's the one sin that cannot be forgiven because if you draw your last breath and you and you, and you can and you're going to say, well, you know what? I'm not even thinking about going to, and standing before God. Why? Your heart's hardened. And because you hardened your heart over a period of time and the Holy Spirit began to back off and God says, I'm not going to force you to love me. I'm not going to force you into a relationship. And then all of a sudden now, people go to church, and when the invitation is given, people normally don't get up and go to, and get on their knees and pray. The most important part of a service, the most important part of the service is the invitation. Have you ever noticed when the preacher starts giving the invitation, that's when all the kids begin to cry? That's when somebody knocks on the door, somebody gets up and walks out, and they become distractions. They don't even realize it. But the most important part of, of any service, even tonight, was the invitation. Allowing the Holy Spirit to reach out and touch your heart, bring conviction that you know you're a sinner in need of a Savior. And if you're saved, listen, what you may need is revival. To revive your spirit to go back like it was the day you got saved. That's why 1 John 1 9 is so important. God, I've messed up. I went my own way, just like the prodigal son, and I, I'm just, I'm sorry. And the prodigal son came back to the father, and the father ran to him and kissed him on, on the neck and gave him a ring and shoes on his feet and everything. He was so excited that, that his son that was lost is now come home. Are you that son or that daughter? That's kind of God. I mean, you don't even want to go to church anymore. Uh, you don't. It's hard for you to listen to a sermon. Uh, you don't read your Bible anymore. There's no conviction there, and because the Bible, that's God breathing His presence into a written form. Now, if you'll get back to reading that Bible like you're supposed to every day, you say, "Well, you know, I'm waiting for somebody to read it with me." No, it's your responsibility. If you don't have anybody to read with you, you read it. In fact, let me show you something in Romans chapter 2, verse 15. Romans chapter 2, verse 15. Watch this right here. Uh, you know, in a biblical sense, our conscience serves as a witness to what we already know. So in Romans chapter 2, verse 15, now the King James Version Bible, it says, which shew the work of the law, written, notice, notice this, written in their hearts written in their hearts and look at here there's the word conscience and their conscience always bearing witness and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another so here we have here that that if we have the word of god written in our hearts and everything else that that's going to be the right and wrong that's that's the that's the thumbprint that, that we're going to look at that's what right we do or what right what we say or and he says but their conscience always bearing a witness you know we talked about using the lord's name in vain and whether no matter where i'm at if i hear somebody say that my conscience says oh that was wrong and i know not to do that and it says in their thoughts the mean while accusing or else excusing one another so many times we we've got people that or living in sin that's so out there, and we don't even, according to Ezekiel chapter 2 and 3, we don't even try to warn them. We don't show any love. On our website, we've got a, 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 a man that used to be the number one high priest of the satanic church. And, uh, and there were like, like four people 
They didn't preach the Bible to them. They didn't go out there and, and, and say, oh, you're, you're, you're worshiping Satan and all this stuff. All they did was love on him. I mean, they, they showed love and kindness. And when they saw him, guess what? They would give him a hug. And here's what he said. He's, he began to cry. He said, I've never known love until those four people came in my life. And the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit was able to bring conviction to him. And so he left the satanic church. And now he's online and, and I, I asked him to be my friend and he accepted that friend request and, and he does these little deals. He says, I'm not preaching to you. Now listen, folks, listen. One of the heads of the satanic church left the satanic church in order to share the love of Christ. And that's what he does. And he shares how, how he feels that love. And, you know, how many of you have had that kind of influence on people? Listen to what it says in Romans chapter 2, the last part. It says, and their thoughts, the mean, either, either accusing or else excusing one another. Listen, the Bible is very clear that if you see a brother or sister living in sin, that you're to go to them out of love. And you're to love on them. And you're to care for them. And, and hopefully they're going to, maybe the Holy, you pray that the Holy Spirit will show them that that's a sin in their life. You heard somebody say this, you know, love the sinner but hate the sin. Same truth here. But in Romans chapter 9 verse 1, uh, Nancy, it says, I say the truth in Christ. I say the truth in Christ. It says, I lie not. And here it is. There's a word conscience. My conscience also bear me witness in the Holy Ghost. So conscience is a trustworthy guide when it is informed by the rule of God. Let me say it again. The uh, conscience is a trustworthy guide only when it is informed and ruled by God. And conscience can also be suppressed by sin. If we desire to develop a positive habit, and we need to perform an action repeatedly over time until that becomes an automatic reflex, okay? Like forgiving, like saying I love you or whatever it might be. But, but consciousness can be suppressed. The same process occurs when we fall into sin. We either uh, accuse it or we excuse it. Uh, when we sin, we reject God's authority. That's what Adam and Eve did. They rejected God's authority. And if we repeat that sin over time, the rejection of God's authority becomes an automatic reflex. I'll give you an illustration. How, how many here have read your Bible and you've read Haggai and Malachi and you understand that God says that the tithe, in fact, Deuteronomy, the last part of Deuteronomy, that the tithe belongs to God. And yet, uh, in Malachi chapter 3, it says, God says, you've robbed me. And they say, how have we robbed thee? He said, in tithes and offerings. See, the offering is mine. And if I give an offering, that's just me saying, God, I want to, maybe it's helping out with a ministry. Maybe it's, the other day we bought a hundred new uh, pamphlets to hand out uh, with the book of St. John, a little bit of Romans that tied to it. And we got more tracts ordered. Why? Because, you see, if, if we repeat our sin, over time, we don't realize that sin is simply rejecting God's authority. And so whenever somebody says, well, I don't go to church because they're always talking about money. No, they're not. They shouldn't be. But I'm telling you right now, you as a Christian should not, should not have a problem in obeying the Word of God. Go back and read uh, Haggai and Malachi tonight. It's going to be very, very short chapters. But uh, God said, if you want to get it right, then bring the tithes and offerings into the sanctuary. And he says, if you do that, otherwise you're cursed with a curse. What does that mean? You're to bring tithes and offerings. If you don't bring, return the tithe to God, that's a sin. That's a curse. And if you don't bring your offering to God, that's a sin. That's a curse. That's why you're cursed with a curse. But he said, if you'll bring the tithe and offering back in, he said, prove me now if I will not what? open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you cannot contain. And then he says that the next verse, and he says, I promise, here's what he said, let me summarize it. I promise to not let the devil, Satan, Lucifer, and, and all the darkness of it. I'm going to do, I'm going to make sure that they do not totally destroy anything and everything that you have. Isn't that amazing? 
not only is he going to open the windows of heaven, but Lady Karen, he's, he's going to fight my battles for me. Does that make sense? So even unbelievers who, uh, and you know, they, they know God's general rules and, and his attributes. They know he's a holy God. And, and they understand the creation ordinances. That it was called the uh, uh, Noahide Laws, which is the seven laws of Noah. But yet they begin to deny such knowledge of sin. Uh, I've never seen so much openness now for sin. Uh, if you're on Facebook, you see it all the time. If you're on YouTube, you can find it all the time. But Paul says that our unrighteousness, uh, we, that we, that it suppresses the truth. And the Bible says the truth shall set you free. But you're not going to listen to the truth. You, over time, you're going to harden your heart. And so in Romans chapter 1, verse 24, it says, Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness. How? Through the lust of their own hearts. To do what? To dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Romans chapter 1, verse 28 says, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. That means uh, uh, acceptable to God. And so believers are also uh, in danger of falling into a very destructive pattern. We know that. Sometimes our sins lead us to doubt. And, and sometimes even to doubt even the reality of God. I've had people that used to come to church faithful, but maybe they went through a hard time. Hi, Starla. Uh, we're talking about leaving with a clear conscience. And, uh, and so here at the end, uh, you have to understand that sin causes our conscience to become seared or corrupted. Because now that we're no longer going to base our lives on what God said, but we're going to do it in spite of what God said. And in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, it says, speaking in uh, lies in hypocrisy, look at this, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. In other words, it no longer bothers them. We were talking about tithes and offerings of it. But so many people say, well, if I don't go to church, I don't have to tithe and give up. No, 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 no. Go back and read Haggai and Malachi and I and get that right. And, and claim First John 1, 9 and, and tell God, God, I, I haven't been doing what you wanted me to do. And so, in fact, the Bible is really clear that, uh, that we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. And Hebrews it tells us that. And, uh, you know, verse 25 and 26 uh, of chapter 10. Uh, so what does it mean? Some people say, well, it's okay if I don't honor God as my creator on the first day of the week. No, it's okay if I don't go to church to honor the Lord Jesus Christ because he's a resurrected God. And uh, so I'm just going to not worry about it that much. So believers get, are in danger of falling into a very destructive pattern. And sin affects the Christian just as much as it does uh, the one that is an unbeliever. And so it's easy to have your conscience seared and corrupted, right? And, and uh, don't forget about 1 Timothy 4, 2, I just read to you, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. There's no going back. In Titus chapter 1, verse 15, it says, Unto the pure, all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. So in order to protect our conscience and keep it working in a working order, uh, we, we need to, when we hear the preaching of the gospel, we need to be thinking about the gospel every day. And so we must call on the Holy Spirit. Here's what I ask you to do. And I say I ask you, this is what I do. And it's call on the Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, if there's any sin that's in my life, that maybe I'm not even aware of, would you bring that in into my mind so I can confess it and get it right and so I'm not going to be reprimanded uh, you know, by, by God and then I can be blessed by God? Only then can our conscience serve its intended purpose of helping us to conform, listen, to the values of the Creator. As God said, as I am holy, be ye holy. So, uh, listen, we, we conform to the values of our conscience. We feel a sense of pleasure 
and even a sense of relief whenever we got things right. But when we violate the values of our conscience, it, it, it introduces a thing called guilt. And so uh, John MacArthur said it this way. He said he described the conscience as, quote, a built-in warning system that signals us when something we have done is wrong, unquote. So the conscience to, uh, to our souls, the, the conscience is to our souls what a pain sensor uh, is to our bodies. And it inflicts distress. It is the form of guilt. And whenever we violate that with our hearts, our hearts are telling us, hey, you got to get this right. We cannot escape our conscience now, we can sear it, we can try to ignore it, but we all have a conscience. We can argue with it, we can defile it, we can harden it, but we, we can never get rid of it, you know. To me today, uh, uh, Starla, to see somebody abusing a child, you know, I just get really upset with that. But at the same time, if I see uh, maybe a husband and wife uh, violating the, the rules of marriage, it ought to bother us today. Uh, you know, our conscience is not the law. Let me say that again. Your conscience is not the law, but it bears witness to the law. It is not a standard, but bears witness to a standard. So if the Bible says that's wrong, then guess what? Well, if, it was, if the sin was wrong 50 years ago, it was wrong 40 years ago. If it was wrong 40 years ago, it's wrong 30 years ago and 20, and 10, and 5, and it's even wrong today. Does that make sense? All right. So it, it, Adam and Eve, when they sinned, what they do? You remember the story? What did Adam and Eve do? They hid from God. That was their conscience. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of of the Lord God. All right, we're back. We lost our signal. I always said during the invitation, that's when everything goes wrong. Okay, so let me help you with this right here. Uh, you know, it, I, I just think that hopefully something was said tonight. All right, let me readjust this right here. Move my camera around a little bit. Maybe I can get a better connection here. And uh, so I, I just pray that this something was said tonight. And you realize that you may not be here tomorrow and someone you love may not be here tomorrow. Why don't I just make a list and sit down and, and if you can talk about it and they want to talk about it so you can both have forgiveness. Whenever I, if I've sinned against you or if you sinned against me, I want to have a conversation. Listen, listen to this conversation for the invitation, okay? Let's say that uh, I'll say the guy's name is Tom, okay? And let's say Tom and I have been really good friends for years and years and years. But something was said or done, now we no longer talk. We no longer speak. But I need to realize that Tom uh, had value in my life then, and he should have value now. So I would go to Tom and say, hey, Tom, can I talk to you just for a second? And if he agrees to it, I would say, Tom, listen, uh, you know, uh, whatever I've done, I am sorry for that because you mean more to me than whatever we were upset over. And so uh, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to allow me to tell you I'm sorry and I mean it. And that uh, if you will, forgive me. And then just pause and wait and see what they may say. And what if they don't want to listen? Well, you've done your part. And you tell them that if you ever want to talk, I would love to have that conversation with you. Okay? So... What, wouldn't that be nice to have a clear conscience tonight? Wouldn't it be nice to know that uh, as you leave, whether it be you know, moving out of town or maybe and you have problems with people on the job, wouldn't it be nice to just go and get that squared away so you know that on the day that you leave this world and you, and you stand before God and the books are open and your life is revealed, the book of life is there, the Lamb's book of life, but there's a third book. There we are. We're back again. So invitation time. All right. So remember, the conscience is like the judge in a courtroom. The, the judge does not make the law. He just only applies the law. 
and uh, our conscience functions according to the laws that we have, the ones that we believe are right and wrong from God. So if we're given a wrong standard, our conscience will still work according to that standard. Okay? So it, it, it's important that our standards line up with the Word of God. Remember our first verse, Matthew chapter 6, verse 22 through 23, the light of the body is the eye. If therefore thy eye be single or healthy, thy whole body shall be full of light. Verse 23, but if thy eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness. So I just ask you to look at 1 John 1, 9. 1 John, this is our invitation. 1 John 1, 9, if, there's that word if, it's up to me. If we confess our sins, notice the, the plurality of that. The Bible says that God, that he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and I love this, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Hey, isn't that a great standard to have in your life? Why don't you, if you've never trusted Christ your Savior, realize it like the thief on the cross, that you're guilty and you deserve the judgment. But then look to Christ, who's who hung on the cross, uh, died for you, shed his blood for you, paid your sin debt in full. And all the thief had to do was say, would you remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom? And Jesus said, today. Why don't you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior? Confess, be willing to repent. That's what that means. And Lord, I know I've got sins in my life. I need to clean that up. And uh, at the same time, though, I know you're going to help me, but I'm just going to call upon you. Romans 10, 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. First John 1, 9 says that, that, that you can know, K-N-O-W, that you're saved. Why not do that right now? Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. And I know that you died for me, rose for me on the third day. You paid for all of my sin debt. Now pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, save me. Lord Jesus, remember me like you did the thief on the cross. Save me right here, right now, and forever. And I give you praise and glory and honor for bringing me into your kingdom into, as a child of God. Then I pray, Holy Spirit, help me. And bring conviction into my life for the things that I do right and even for the things I do wrong. That I can bring glory and honor to the Father. In Jesus' name I pray. All right. We're so glad you joined us. And we're having internet problems here. But you know what? You just keep on going until it reconnects. And so in that, we love you in the Lord. If we can help you in any way, reach out to us. Contact us. And we want to be a blessing to you. So in Jesus' name. We're going to say hugs and kisses in Jesus' name. God bless you all. Thanks for being here.